Okay, so I guess I'll introduce you. I'm very happy to have you guys speak today. We will have Valentina Gumenyuk and Noam Khaled. Um, Valentina is instructor in neurology at Harvard Medical School and research scientist at Martino Center for Biomedical um, Imaging of Massachusetts General Hospital. She received her master's degree in chemistry and biology from Odessa State University in Ukraine and her PhD from the University of Helsinki in Finland. She then conducted her postdoc on auditory skin development in children at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. She then moved to Henry Hospital in Detroit, uh, where she conducted clinical research in the field of sleep medicine and was awarded an NIH KO1 grant to study how to help night shift workers to adjust their cognitive and sleep functions to abnormal work hours. She's now at Martino Centers of MGH, where she conducts clinical and research work with epilepsy patients using both, both electroencephalography and magnet encephalography. She has evaluated so far over 600 patients and generated clinical mag reports for surgical planning. Currently, she's working with Noam Khaled to develop a novel tool for the analysis of complicated epilepsy cases. So Noam Pellet is also research scientist at MGH Martino Center and instructor at Harvard Medical School. He has a broad uh, background in neuroimaging with specific training and expertise in the analysis and visualization of multimodality neuroimaging data sets. He received his PhD in machine learning and games theory for, from Balran University of Israel. And as the leading developer of the multimodality analysis and visualization <coughs> tool, the MMBT, he laid the background, the groundwork for developing a unique interactive platform to analyze and visualize multimodality neuroimaging data sets like EEG, MAG, fMRI, and PET. So we're very, we're very happy to hear more about your work. The title of their talk today is From Dipole Speed to Causality connectivity analysis using XBIT and MMBT. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for our invitation. We are very excited to be a part of this course and we're very excited to uh, continue work with you guys with the, in, in research and clinical work. So uh, Noam and I working in the David Cohen Mac lab at Martina Center uh, in Navy Yard and let's start. So David is actually um, greeting all of us and sent us best wishes to all our research and clinical work. And uh, he just sent us uh, all his friendly smile as usual. So guys, I hope you appreciate his, uh, his mood. Uh, we all know that internationally and nationally, my clinical practice is growing, which is good. And on national level, we know that labs are uh, using more and more clinical practice uh, for different, uh, for different uh, diesel brain disorders, mostly epilepsy, but they move into uh, to brain trauma and Alzheimer and other neurological disorder using MEG um, modality. And we also know, which is good for clinical, uh, for clinical field, that MAC laboratory is more and more open in Europe and recently in Israel. So different labs using different systems and um, the system different from the software, hardware, and so forth. For example, in our lab, we're using 306 squid sensor uh, arrays, which is a suitable for detection, very slow DC uh, field from the brain up to 1000 Hertz and above. And Ellen, Yosha, and Mati did build a nice, cute system, which is very unique, Baby Mac, also with a high sensor array. And the system is actually have uniqueness that it's very well attached uh, to, the, to, the, to the patient uh, head surface. So basically you can measure whatever happens on the surface of the head. In our system, this helmet a little bit bigger from Baby Mac and Patients who have a small head like kids have a little bit distance between surface and, and, and um, helmet, but head uh, of the adults completely covered and we can measure uh, MAC field, MEG field quite nicely. So we also, in our lab, we built another system 
uh, Orang, Yosha, and Mati did build optically pumped magnetometer system, OPM, which is now is testing for sensitivity and specificity and accuracy. So Mati called the system Young Sister. Uh, you should ask why. But uh, they're testing right now with a great team of researchers of across uh, how it's sensitive and how it's uh, accurately recording the magnetic field. It's completely different from system we have, which we use for e clinical use, but potentially we can actually use in future this system as well, because it will be actually doing MAC and TMS uh, studies. So we all know right now that right, all available diagnostic tools has a different special temporal and invasive uh, approach. And Therefore, you know, we're going to focus on the MEG um, uh, temporal resolution, very accurate temporal resolution, which is was shown many, many studies, including temporal resolution close to intracranial EEGs uh, uh, measurements, and also special resolution much better for MEG as compared with EEG. However, intracranial EEG requires full scale of uh, surgery, whereas MEG we know it's non-invasive. And I would add to this actually uh, also that MAC can see the whole entire brain. So it means that we can investigate the whole network uh, across whole brain non-invasively, whereas intracranial EG, you apply that modality only when you know where to go and you may or may not uh, see the network which you are targeting. From research uh, where MEG and EEG being compared many, many, many times with, with a very good approach, we know that there's some sources in the brain can be seen by MAC and EEG or both. Like for example, if we say that is a sphere, uh, like assume it's a schematic head. So if source tangential MEG and EEG can see nicely that source. But if it's so radial, MAC cannot see that source, but EEG can. And the same for the deep source in the brain. The EEG do, does not do good job as compared with EEG. It's more complicated uh, uh, sources in the brain also can be seen differently by MEG and EEG. So therefore, we have a kind of like, might you call them silent source in the brain, where is a no MAC, no EEG, no MAC or no EEG can be seen. However, if we use all this modality like EEG and MEG simultaneously, we can actually compensate uh, uh, some, uh, uh, some disadvantages of the modality. Like for example, here on the middle of the screen, you can see radial source cannot be seen on Mac nicely, whereas uh, EEG can pick it up and compensation in writing EEG and MEG simultaneously on the patient or on the subject, you can compensate that disadvantage. So for analyzing the studies and analyzing the MAG, uh, very complicated um, signal, you can apply parametric models, which is uh, XFIT uh, from Neuromax software. Uh, and that's why uh, we're, going, we're going to explain you how we're using XFIT together with more uh, sophisticated and more advanced current distribution models. And Noel will talk to you today and introduce his tool, which is MMVT tool. It's a, it's a very, uh, very, very advanced and has a lot of capacity to help us to understand the network and relationship between network in epilepsy patients. For example, uh, the question always become, because we're dealing with spontaneous data, we're not dealing mostly with evoked data with uh, epilepsy patients. For example, if you have activated area like this, so is a dipole good for that source? Uh, well, it was proven, yes, it is good. And if you have a higher goodness of fit, 99.9% .9 or 90%, it's almost will overlay, dipole will overlay and detect this source. And for MRI uh, view, you can see that is how it, it's seen. So you have detected source on the red and, P, and, and green is a dipole, which is overlay with this uh, single source. But what happened if we have not single source and mostly a MAC patients are more difficult patients uh, in terms of their signal. So that's why they sent uh, for the MEG study, uh, those more complicated patients where they can see bilateral source where EEG can see generalized, generalized uh, activity, where EEG just see uh, you know, uh, activity which is, comes from both hemispheres at the same time or multi-source. 
So those puzzled and most difficult, complicated patients usually go to the max exam. And we kind of should to find out how exactly and what is the accuracy should be uh, performed when you analyze it, when we analyze in their data and give results to surgeon uh, how to plan surgery or do implantation. So those questions really hard to answer, especially if we deal with the spontaneous data. And that's how we started work with Norm and introduce, uh, I'm gonna give him now a screen. He will introduce his brilliant tool, which has a big, big future. Uh, Norm, please. Thank you, Vanya. <clears throat> okay, because everything is about surgery and surgical decisions. We also uh, included the automated algorithm that I'm going to talk a little bit about that help clinicians, for example, localize the invasive electrodes and so on, and also find epileptic seizures. So the tool is, uh, uh, this is how the tools look like. I'll give a short uh, live demo. It has two parts, uh, the user interface and also the pre-processing steps that is currently the command line modules that can help clinicians to analyze the raw data from raw until statistics, and then import the tool into the, import the data into the tool. Um, another aspect of the tool that kind of uh, for future use, we start creating an augmented reality application, which I'm going to show. And yeah, so let's just show you the, uh, this is how the tools look like. Right? The 3D head here, it's a 3D reconstruction based on FreeSurfer, if you know FreeSurfer. So this is based on the dichroms of the patient. And so you can see it's a real object. You can remove a hemisphere and see the activation. Here the activity is a MEG source estimate for a given condition, but you can plot whatever activity that can be plot on the surface. If it's fMRI that can be projected, PET, SPECT, and also everything like that. It has uh, the advantage of also a 3D model, but also if you click somewhere, you can see exactly where you are on the 2D slices. Um, let's say that this patient also had invasive electrodes. So you see those spheres. Um, those spheres, each one is a contact. And if I click on one of them, I'll see the data that was recorded from this specific electrode. So I can choose different electrodes. I can also ask questions like, which electrode detect the onset of the seizures and all of that. Um, this tool, and we're going to talk quite a bit about it, also support connectivity. So if we'll hide now both hemisphere, so, for example, this connectivity shows the difference between MEG and fMRI hubs. That's only one example. Um, and for the augmented reality, if you know about the concept of augmented reality, everything, it's not like virtual reality, everything is real, except this uh, Star Wars base. <laughs> it looks like from Star Wars. So let me run that. This is what you will see using HoloLens, Microsoft HoloLens. So those are the slides. The, the same 3D brain that I already show you up here. And you can interact with the brain. So you can remove a hemisphere. You can see the invasive electrodes here. In the future, we'll be able to click like I just, just did in the MVT platform. And you can also zoom in. So the idea that we'll be able to dynamically stream the data from MMVT to the hologram, and the clinician will be able, all of them will be able to interact and see the same object, or even remotely. And what we want to take it even forward, that clinician will be able to run a whole a simulation of the surgery on top of this patient's head using their own tools. So let's go back a little bit. Uh, this is a diagram shows the different pre-processing pipelines of MMBT for different modalities. Basically, we uh, implement the analysis stream for each modality, and in the end, everything is imported into MMBT. So let's go over some nice examples. Uh, this example, for example, it's a fMRI resting state. 
So you can see here how the connectivity change over time, while you can also see the raw resting state fMRI data, and how it changes over time. Uh, for example, this is a bump for the connection, so you can go here and see exactly what happened. So you can see in parallel the when and the where. So we can see that something happened here, for example, in the V1, maybe. And let's move forward. Uh, this example showed uh, how you can compare different modalities. So we took 30 healthy subjects and we create, we calculated the main hub for each modality. It's the MEG and the fMRI. And you can also see the connection. So this is the main hub and this is the connectivity from different brain regions. Uh, if you are not familiar, this is the flat map of the brain. Uh, we call it the dead zebra. Uh, <laughs> view. It's really hard to understand what's going on, but it's a good view if you want to visualize everything in the same place. And one of the algorithms that we implemented is to automatically identify uh, SIG, uh, invasive electrode. So this is how it works. It detect different electrodes automatically and remove the rest as noise. So after that, if something still needed to be tweaked, you can import it in MMVT and then very easily, for example, insert a contact here. Um, another exam example is, uh, for example, if you have a grid, not just a SIG. So this is the grid of the patient and look exactly where it is in the brain and also in the city, you can see it here. Um, this is a very clinical example. If you want to implant a device on the surface, on the skull surface, so here we calculate the thickness of the skull to understand where the device should be implanted. So for example, here I'm putting the rectangle as a device. Not rectangle, sorry. This device. And let's move it here, and I can see the statistics of the thickness underneath the device. So clinician will be able to understand where is the optimal place for implantation. Um, another algorithm that Vale and I are working right now and want to push for publication is to automatically detect uh, seizures onset in epilepsy patients. And we use a concept from graph theory called uh, influence or eigenvector uh, centrality. And you can see that there is a bump of a peak of the influence of this node just before the onset. You can see also that these electrodes, this is the signal, so we can see that we actually detect the onset. And the interesting thing about this algorithm is that it can detect the seizures in different modalities. The same algorithm is working in invasive electrode age in MEG. Um, okay, so a bit about the augmented reality. Uh, this is how it's going to work. Uh, this is the Microsoft uh, HoloLens devices that are uh, synchronized to each other. And everything is dynamically streamed from MVT. And the nice thing that you can, we want to take it in the future inside the OR. So if the patient lay in the OR and she can't move her head, we can identify it automatically special features and co-register the patient head to her MRI space and know exactly where the, where the surgeon is putting his scalpel, for example. Or also, the neurosurgeons will be able to visualize all the rich data sets that he collected in the surgical planning session. And of course, we want to take it also for neurosurgical training because uh, we think uh, it's really nice tool and, um, <clears throat> and clinician will be able to train other holograms and not other corpse, for example. So you can find more information about MVT in those links uh, where the website, everything is by the way free and you can, can be downloaded from GitHub and there is also a manuscript about it. So Valia. Thank you, Noam. Thank you so much for nice introduction of MMVT. And it's also not just visualizing tool, as Noam mentioned, it's analyzing tool as well. 
And that's why we're working together to, uh, first of all, to generate pipelines uh, for most difficult cases and to bring the MMVT results together with XFIT. And XFIT, we know it's FDA approved, and therefore we check in each other how we are accurate with results. And here's an example of our montage from our lab. So all patients were recording with EG, uh, with 70 EG cap um, and uh, 306 uh, MAC sensors, which is uh, 100, uh, three, 103 magnetometers and 203 uh, gradiometers. And that's why we can see from different angle the signal which we pick it up from the helmet. So here's an example of one of our case we want to discuss, and I lost my screen. Sorry about that. No, can I have a control? Yeah, you should have a control. Yeah, I don't have a I don't have a screen right now. I don't have my presentation now. One second. Second, not so much. So oh, sorry, stop also this tension. Yeah, and sign now? Yeah. Thank you. Um, it doesn't go further. Okay, if... Uh, oh, no, it doesn't. And let's give you an, Yeah, you should have it. Now. Try again. One second, one second. Let me... One second. Sorry. Sorry? Please yes. Stop. Please, one second. Let me just click on the... Yeah. So we had a patient from um, um, Boston Children. She's six years old, and she was born with bilateral occipital stroke. Uh, the, 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 the child was actually a um, very nice uh, uh, kind of cooperative in the MAC lab. She was only six, but she had a 10, 20 seizures a day. And it was, uh, she has a bilateral, as I say, bilateral MRI, um, focus of her uh, malformation. And the MAC shows bilateral activity as well, occipital uh, right spikes and occipital left spikes. And uh, dipoles we constr constructed from the X feet, you can see uh, her left and right spikes on the occipital lobe. So what is interesting, the source was quite complicated because when you go to the peak of the, of the any spike, so it gives you the magnetometers gives you more um, right activity as compared with left, but gradiometers gives you the left and right activity. So it seems to be to us uh, on that time that it's very complicated in terms of distinguishing activity from the left and right and to find pathology uh, in the left and right independently, or it's, we cannot separate them. We, we didn't know in that time. So that's why, you know, we, try to think with know what can be done with this patient. And um, this uh, data was presented um, to surgeons. And from this data, we know the place. We know that independent left, independent right, occipital lobe clusters. But what next? What, how we can answer questions? What is more active? What is less active? Maybe what is a network is behaving? How network is behaving? Is it potentially possible to do surgery on this kid? Is it potentially uh, we can do seek on this kid? Uh, not we, but uh, in the clinic. Or, you know, this patient should be implanted with VNS or something device which is, can generally stop her seizures. So that questions we could not answer with the dipole analysis. And that's why uh, Norm developed uh, interesting, uh, uh, interesting analysis, further analysis, how to investigate more deeply the clusters from left and right occipital lobe. Yeah, thank you, Vanya. 
Um, so we try to tackle this problem from completely different approach using source estimation, not double fit. And we use the concept of uh, normalization. So <clears throat> first, as Valia mentioned, we, this patient had two clusters of interactors clips. So we average both of them. So now we have two uh, average activation. We call it EPI from epilepsy. And for normalization, we we found the baseline clips. And baseline, we mean that there is no Valia manually chose those clips to have no ictal or interictal activity. And we call it no IP. Uh, so first we try to uh, calculate the power spectrum and, uh, analysis on this patient and to normalize it. So just a reminder uh, to calculate the Z values, we remove the mean of the baseline and divide it by the sudden deviation of the baseline. And now we can talk about this score. And the nice thing about this score or Z values that are, they, are, they don't have units and it's, it's actually a units of standard deviation. So everything above two or below minus two means that it's, it can be significant. And, and significant here, the, it's uh, important to understand that significant it means that it's significantly like epilepsy uh, as compared to the baseline of no ictal interactive activity. So the power spectrums work like that, and what you need, what I want to emphasize here, that the white usually you don't see white here. So we just remove all the pixels with this course below two, meaning that it wasn't significant as compared to the baseline. So everything that you can see here in the power, it means that it significantly uh, uh, correlates with the epilepsy activity. So there were left spike cluster and right spike cluster. And just for examination, we saw that you, we, there was a higher peak in the gamma band in the right spikes. And you can see that there are difference between those two clusters. So to understand better the dynamics, because it's kind of hard to understand the dynamics from this power spectrum, we first wanted to understand the functional ROIs. And what I mean in functional ROIs, we, for each cluster, we calculate uh, the source estimate. So using uh, MNE or DSPM, it's a uh, MNE, it's more minimal norm estimate. And we normalize this activity exactly like we did with the power. So now, instead of the units of the activation is again Z values and we can remove everything below two. So we can stay now only with activity that was significantly correlated with epilepsy. And to capture the dynamics, we did it with sliding windows of 100 milliseconds. And we calculate the clustering for each window, meaning that if there were just a um, few vertices with high significance, that may be a noise. So we want to capture blobs of significance that have some kind of minimal size, and all of them have Z values above two. Um, just to realize if that makes any sense, we calculated the maximum uh, Z value for each vertex over time. So you can see that there is a huge peak uh, around zero, and that's and also the nice thing that it's not significant before that. So it became, the activity became significantly relevant to epilepsy starting from the onset and reached some kind of significance. So that gave us a good clue that we are on the right uh, way or right path. And the second thing that we did now is uh, to try to capture the dynamics. So how this uh, normalized activity change over time. And that usually we, we are making movies, but we want to have a one static image that can tell us part of the story. So what we did here is we plot the time and not the Z values, meaning that we plot everything, all the clusters that were above two. And as color, we picked, we calculated the color according to the time that this activity occurred. So if it's red, that means that it was like that, for example, that it was just after the onset. 
and uh, more yellowish, you, you see that it came later. So you can start to, we can start to get the understanding of how the dynamics of the scissors uh, happen. So for example, here it started here and then it propagates here and also here. And that was in the right average spikes, but in the left, it's, it's really hard to understand where it even, when and where it, the origin was. Uh, but one really interesting finding here that as you can see that right average, when it started, it stayed mostly in the right hemisphere, but left, when it was starting the left, it jumped to the right. And both in the, in both the left average and the right average spikes, you can see that we found the same almost the same functional arise. So that gave us hope that those locations are taking place in both clusters, meaning that if this patient is going to have RNS, it's a good candidate for the RNS electrodes. Maria? Yeah, thank you, Noam. Uh, yes, that patient, uh, six years old, was implanted with RNS, and uh, we, as far as I, we know, she's doing much better than before, and hopefully uh, there will be no resections, or it will be resection, but depends on her uh, development with, with seizures. Another case we would like to present you, it's a patient is 21 years old. Uh, she is a female and she has epilepsy started at 16 when she was 16 years old. She has very interesting semiology. Basically, she has aura. She may feel flushed, chilled, uh, flu-like symptoms and tonic-clonic may have a tonic-clonic um, movement and may have visual uh, hallucinations or specifically she sees color in her peripheral vision. Um, so postictally, she confused frequency of the seizure two weeks, uh, two times a week, and often she may have clusters, uh, so it can be even more than two times a week. Uh, not clear what can exactly tri triggers those seizures, and mostly she says it's stress, but uh, uh, it's not, it wasn't clear. So her hemorrhage shows with non-lesional, and PET shows non-lesional, and she had a two seizures during admission with AMU. Uh, only three seizures being recorded at that time when she was uh, uh, admitted. And two seizures was kind of um, pointed to the right hemisphere. One was in the right, in the right temporal onset, another was kind of right hemisphere with the not clear lobe onset. And third seizure was not clear. So we had her in our study, and um, this is her um, spike of EG was found on the right. And Max shows nice right temporal onset of the spike. So across all uh, head view, you can see front, back, and right, and left. You can see nice spike in uh, a waveform. And the dipole is in the right temporal lobe. So another spike was found on the left, uh, and it was independent from the right, as far as we can see from the central level. Uh, again, this is the same page, which is, was correspond to the EEG. So you see why wave, uh, spike and wave on the left temporal, uh, and the dipole left, uh, you can see the localized in the left temporal. So the summary of her MAC um, interictal dipoles found in the study looks like this. She has, uh, based on what dipole can see analysis, independent right cluster and independent left cluster. And uh, again, it's, she's, she's very ready for surgery because, of course, she needs uh, uh, concentration, she needs to go to school, and she cannot go with this uh, disease. Um, Alone uh, and continue. So that's why you know she was kind of interesting uh, patient for us to develop another quite interesting model uh, in MMVT. And before I will give screen to Noam, I will I would like to point to you the study which was published in Brain uh, was. Um, focusing on the epileptic, uh, epileptic patients who may experience with a visual phenomenon or visual auras. And it's interesting within study, well, it was well known from 50 that temporal lobe epilepsy can give this uh, aura for visual field. But 
This study is actually took the occipital lobe patients, temporal occipital junction, and anterior general and anterior medial temporal lobe patients. And the summary of the study showed that these patients who have anterior medial temporal lobe has a much more visual phenomenon or auras as compared with these two groups. That's kind of interesting for our further uh, explanation of this case. Uh, okay, what happened to, uh, I think we missed a slide, Never mind. So what we did here was to calculate the connectivity and then we wanted not just to calculate the connectivity but to calculate the causality because we wanted to know which area caused an activation in, in another area. So for that we used Ganser causality and we use again as nodes to use the functional Y that we found using the previous uh, method that we described and we use again the sliding windows and calculate the Ganser causality for each window and just to make sure that the causality that we capture is not a, a regular causality that also occurs in other times in the brain, we again use the normalization process to understand, to find out the disco. So the units now are not causality, they are disco, and we show here only connections that have causality which is significant higher in the epilepsy clips. So for what we called a wake right, and why we call it wake, it's because we took a baseline from uh, the wake uh, when the patient was awake, and we used it for norm normalization. So first thing that you can see that we did capture the uh, two clusters were here and here. So we capture some kind of a network, and red means that the causality is from right to left, and this is a mirror image, so this is the right hemisphere. So it's propagate from here and then move here. This is the other um, cluster. And if we take the cluster of the left, the really interesting finding here that again we found the same network, even that we use different clusters. But we ask ourselves, um, why, what if we'll take baseline not from the beginning of the recording, but after he, the patient uh, fall asleep? And our assumption here that because the sleep activity is much more synchronized, it means the variation of the causality in the sleep will be lower. And if the variation is lower, we might get more connections that are significantly higher for epileptic activity. So this is exactly what we got. Uh, the same right cluster now when we normalize it using the uh, sleep baseline, we got way many connections. And the very interesting that if we show all the significant connections, you can see here it's quite, quite a mess, but both of them, right and left, has exactly the same network. And if we filter it a bit for just connections that the Z values are above five, meaning that they are really, really significant, we saw something very amazing. So in this right hemisphere, the clusters are here. Again, we see those, this connection between those two clusters from uh, this is red, so right to left, and also for here. But we also see an inter-hemi connection from the uh, nodes of the clusters to the occipital lobe. And this is highly interesting because as Valia mentioned, this patient has some kind of uh, hallucination or a visual uh, activation that occurred only while she was uh, in her seizures. And no, no other method or modality could capture or to give us some understanding why she's getting this kind of auras. Because we couldn't detect any epileptic activity in the occipital lobe. And, the con and this connectivity method was the only one that helped start helping us to understand why she got this aura. So again, in the left. And just to show you when you were going to the PL mode, here I also import the dipoles. The dipoles are the white 
Python pipes here. So we, we can just may see that it highly correlates here, the location of the dipoles. And here it's correlated, but it's a bit a little bit far from the nodes. And it's a good point to understand that dipoles are volumetric methods, meaning that the dipole field give us a voxel that can, it doesn't need to be necessarily on the surface. It could be also underneath the surface or deep structures. But when we're using minimal norm estimation or any other source distribution say, method, the constraint is the activity must, uh, uh, must be happening on the, <clears throat> on the surface. So it means that what we capture here is an activity that may be propagate from the dipoles to the surface. So minimal norm estimates, we can capture only this kind of activity. Uh, and as you can see, it's close enough to the location of the dipole. So there might be a propagation here. This is why we capture those nodes. Uh, OK, thanks so much. Uh, here you can see what we are doing uh, in the lab. <laughs> we are playing with the holograms of brains. You could see the hologram here. One point he also tried to kick it. It was really funny. So we please join us and come. I wouldn't say come visit us, but maybe one day <laughs> we can have a nice meeting. And we want to thank everybody in the lab and also our collaborators uh, from Boston Children and other hospitals that are sending us patients. And Violet, if you want to say anything about here. Yes, uh, thank you so much for amazing opportunity to present our talk today. And this is our team. So now Matsuda, she is a tech, she's working very hard and she's been in the lab with Steven for 13 years. Uh, she's getting baby in November. And because she's uh, very ready to go for maternity leave, we have a new team trained, Nicole, Tori, Michelle, to help us uh, with recording because we have two, three patients a week. And Nauro was doing a lot of work uh, before me and Tepe is a fellow in our lab. And Nicole, she will kind of substitute now. And this is a MMVT production of Norm Palette. Thank you so much and we are ready for our discussion. I uh, just want to make to uh, everybody here that have MRI scan, if you want such a picture of yourself, uh, please let me know. And thanks so much. Thank you. If everyone has any questions, that was a great talk. Yeah, thank you very much. It's, it's Joe Madsen. Um, I, I'm always curious when I see Granger causality calculations from uh, from meg data or data that could be obtained, uh, you know, in, in normal controls under control circumstances, um, and then you you say, well, we're gonna we're gonna only look at the, you know, ich, the the epileptic signatures. You know, we only want to look at the spikes because otherwise it's it's garbage. We only care about that. And in fact. The network that may be important in the epilepsy, at least what we, we see in, in, in interictal, in, in our uh, invasive monitoring, uh, may be quite relevant and might be quite uh, unusual and, and sort of locally interesting uh, in those, those non-spike, non-ictal periods. So uh, I was curious, if, for example, in that last patient that you, you showed, uh, there were all of these clusters down in the temporal lobes on both sides, and then there was a, a an implication about the, the the laterality, but that was all up in some neocortical area that was way up high on the convexity that the you know was less obvious on the 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 vertex view than it was on the on the front view that that was there was an area that seems to be of interest to whatever phenomenon you're looking at, but is far away from the area where most of the dipoles were. So, so it's 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 a little bit hard from that one case to make too much of an of a for me to understand what that would mean in terms of localization of the of the sur of the uh, epilepsy if you're going to do something like a surgical intervention. Um, on the other hand, if, if you're able to 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 collect data and do uh, prospective Granger studies on any Meg study, 
oh, why not look at the whole brain and try to, to, to you know, divide up the, 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 the spatial uh, uh, generator into lots of little arbitrarily localized generators rather than the ones you think of the spike foci and see what the network looks like overall. To me, that might be quite interesting. And I, and I, and I haven't ever seen that in Meg. Yeah, so thanks so much, uh, Joe. Uh, first, uh, Vali actually asked me yesterday what will answer if someone will ask us about exactly what you ask about this activity in the frontal. And the question and the answer is that we, we don't know. It's an ongoing study and it's actually very interesting to understand what the heck is going on over there. The occipital lobe, we may have some kind of a clue because this patient has the auras. But since the neocortical, it, it's a very interesting question why this algorithm captured those nodes. And for your other comments, I just want to emphasize that we, this is actually a whole head analysis. We didn't uh, just, uh, we let the algorithm to detect by itself the nodes all over the brain. So we use the function ROIs for that, that we normalize based on the baseline activity and we cluster those uh, significant uh, event. Meaning that this algorithm, the first step was to understand where the nodes of the networks are, and then we just calculate the causality. Uh, so there was, there was no assumption. I didn't give the algorithm the location of the dipoles. And one really interesting result was that it's actually captured in both hubs, locations that were really close to the dipoles that Valia found. So that kind of was kind of a reassuring, but you're totally right. We need to, invest, to check this algorithm on more than one patient or three. We want to do some kind of 10, 20, 30. So I, we actually want to talk about, with you about it maybe after this meeting. But thanks so much for those comments. And thank you so much, Joe and Norm, for commenting this. Uh, it's quite interesting. So we enter in, in the spontaneous data, analyzing spontaneous, uh, spontaneous activity and relationship in network. As Joe mentioned, healthy network or physiological network, a pathological network. So we have a lot of questions to ask. And of course, we need to test how algorithm accurately is working. And one of the assumptions for us is take, it's take a well-known, well for example, evoke response and run algorithm for that and see what we can find and what we can uh, take into account and we can disregard. So it's a lot of work needs to be done, of course, but we're trying to find solution which is a perfectly will fit uh, with, with, the, with, the, with the patient's needs. And um, yes, we, we are willing to work more on that. Um, could I ask a question? Uh, uh, thank you so much. That was, that was a great talk. And I, it's so exciting to see all the, the futuristic, uh, you know, the future of medicine, uh, you know, when everything's going to be uh, Star Trek virtual holodeck, uh, um, uh, you know, holodeck and, and, and we can all, you know, do, do everything virtually, but <laughs> which we already are, I guess. Um, so, sorry, my name is Peter Davis. I'm a neurologist at Boston Children's. Um, I'm very interested in uh, sleep and connectivity. And I was curious with the um, uh, analysis that you did with sleep, where you saw a lot more um, increase in connectivity. Do you think one that that's um, just because during wake, you're, you're kind of obscuring a lot of the connectivity with, with other kind of you know, cognitive uh, act activity that's going on. Um, uh, and two, what uh, sleep stage are you analyzing there or just kind of broadly sleep in general? So uh, let me answer. Yeah, right answer. Thank you so much for this beautiful question. And yeah, sleep is quite important for us and for patients that comes to this study. So all our patients have a natural sleep while we're doing MAC uh, evaluation. And that's why we found the best solution to keep them still in the MAC. And of course, fee sleep has a huge impact on epileptic activity, as we know. So therefore, you know, the sleep and wake uh, conditions being implemented here for connectivity. This is very, very first, as far as I know, approach to understand how sleep baseline, because you know, for this connectivity analysis, we use baseline. And in baseline, we assume that in sleep stage two, where we can see K-complexes and spindles, 
the brain is more synchronized as compared with wake uh, condition where just uh, drowsy uh, or just uh, very beginning of the study. And that's why, you know, you see this kind of differences because the baseline play a role for, uh, for significance. So, and that's why, you know, the more variation or more variety of the signal as in the wake and less synchrony, that's why you see less connections as compared with, uh, with the sleep condition. Um, I, wa I just want to add, uh, let me share the screen again. Uh, that what we see here, it doesn't mean necessarily that there were more connections in sleep versus awake. It just means that those uh, connections now are significant different from the baseline. So, for example, if we take this connection here, uh, this connection is, uh, we tested it again uh, against uh, five or ten clips of baseline, and then we calculate the z-value. So that only means that this we are plotting this connection just because the z-value is above two. But it doesn't mean that there is no causality or the causality is lower or higher in sleep or awake. And our hypothesis that why we capture so many uh, connections that are significantly when we compare to sleep versus awake, it's because the behavior of the baseline and in, if we go a bit before to the equation uh, here, so we have this part of the equation of the standard deviation of the baseline. And if the activity is more synchronized, like in sleep, it means that the standard deviation might be lower and this give us higher Z values. So this is our assumption, at least, why we see more connections in, when we compare to sleep versus awake. But it doesn't mean that there is less or more connections of the world. And okay. thanks again for the question. It's a very important point. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. I, I just one quick follow up question. The baseline. So then what are you using um, uh, as baseline during awake and, and versus baseline during a sleep? Yeah. So those are clips that Valia manually found over uh, the whole recording. That there are clips of around five, ten seconds with no ictal or interictal activity. And also no sleep versus wake. Yeah. So obviously wake 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 baseline where the patient is awake and we can see from the from the from the waveforms. And sleep was uh was was captured, uh, sleep sleep baseline was clipped uh, from the stage to sleep. No ictals. Um, hello, I'm Nyo. Hi, Paria. Hi. Hi. Um, uh, hi, Noah. So, hi. um, I'm uh, wondering that you, when you say the the baseline, I I believe that when you say the interrector, you, you mean the interrector spikes, right? Usually, when we have the no seizure, that we we say the interrector baseline, and and then when you are looking at this uh, the baseline versus the interrector in your term. That is the interrector spikes. Is that right? So baseline is actually it's physiological, completely physiological activity. We don't see any spikes, any okay. uh, slowing or focal no slowing. It's it's a physiological waveforms. Yeah. Okay. Is it either in the within sleep portion of the data or wake portion of the data? And then I have a question to um, Noam about the MMBT. Um, I believe that a few years ago you. Um, I downloaded it and, and we installed it in our computer about the MMVT. I'm, um, I believe you developed a little more um, functions in there. I'm wondering whether you have some um, function or maybe will be a function to the uh, plan, the stereotactic of uh, the depth electrode planning. Because I know that you, you have this electrode that is already implanted and you can click that and then you have this data, uh, like a visualization of the each electrode, the, the data and everything. But um, like uh, uh, from the purpose of planning ahead of, uh, you know, the surgical, um, you know, the implantation, you have, you think that uh, it, it can be added in the function? That you, yeah. Uh, yeah. And this is an excellent question. Uh, 
Joe, I think half a year ago, asked me if we can do something like that. And yeah. uh, this is a great application because you already have all these modalities in the same space. So we actually want to do it now and to help with the planning of the implementation because now you can see, okay, this is using the functional map, this is the language area, for example, so if we shouldn't plant there, it was here. Or using the DTI data, um, we shouldn't have this uh, action button, for example. Or using the EEG and MEG results, we should target those kind of areas. So yes, what we are going to do now is to kind of implement a, a intelligence layer on top of MMVT to help with the planning and oh, the decision. Yeah, um, yeah, for the planning, usually surgeons sit down, very take a lot of time to figure out how to avoid this vessel, blood vessel, because yes. because the tactic uh, that should not puncture this blood vessel. And yes. so when yes. you uh, when I see the brain uh, in the MMVT, I don't see the blood vessels, and but yes. if you are integrated in the, the planning one, then probably you need to have very nice like visualization of each blood vessel. Do you think it's it's doable? Yes, yes, this is uh, yeah we, we yes very very doable. Oh this yeah, the, the, something the, that we want to do, and it's ex extremely important as you mentioned. Yeah, but okay. It's better to hit uh, to hit it in the planning and not in the actual surgery. So, okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, oh, I don't know if Alan. Oh, I just have a quick question. Uh, like, uh, the devil's always in the details, and I'm curious about the registration of the CT, of particularly the depth electrodes, where there's distortion to the MRI. Have you validated the registration approaches, and and how well does that perform in general? Yeah. And also, what do you? How does it work when you have a brain that's distorted and doesn't go through free circuit? Yes. So one big disadvantage of our tool is that if we cannot reconstruct the MRI using free surfer, we currently we are kind of stuck. So for now, we're working only on patients that we can reconstruct using free surfer. Yeah, this is a big. Have you been in the infant free surfer that Lila put together? Because we found that. Uh, better on like the younger kids we definitely need to switch to that yeah we saw the paper um, and also for the reconstruction uh, we are working closely with the free software group about that and after running the reconstruction uh, when you load everything to mmvt you can switch in the slide viewer to a mode that you can see both the mri and the city and we're taking only the elements in the city that are above some kind of threshold, like 2000. So usually you will be able to see only the electrode and the skull. And then it's very easy to see if the corgus threshold was doing was, was right or not, if there is some kind of bias, because it's on top of each other, the blue uh, voxels from the city and the T1. So yes, if we cannot corgus start it, then yeah, we need to, uh, we're not going forward to the next step, of course. And do you account for the subdural collections? Because that also causes distortion too, right? Yes, yes. Uh, you also can, we also use, uh, first of all, can give you some kind of a score how well the core registration went, but of course we need to investigate it by eye and manually. Thank you. It's a wonderful presentation. Well, thanks so much. Um, I actually have a few questions, but I guess we can discuss that. Uh, later because I have many but I so I'll, I'll ask just one general one is uh, so I know you guys also collect simultaneous EEG and I was wondering if you did any of this analysis on EEG and what what's your feeling if you and yeah if you have compared that um, and then just a follow-up again on that baseline that you mentioned before I was wondering why not to just choose the baseline in the same, like if your activity is during sleep, you choose the baseline during sleep. And if your activity is during awake, you choose the baseline during awake. If that's, yeah. Yes, um, Valerie, do you want to answer the second question? Yes, uh, we use in baseline, we for example, uh, the data we are collecting, it's 10 minutes run. So when we use uh, sleep, f first of all, during the sleep, as you may know well, it's much more in uh, uh activity happening to be as in awake. And um, 
so therefore, you know, when uh, we see the page of the sleep, we collecting from the sleep page baseline independent from intrictals. So intrictals goes not overlap with the baseline. And baseline has a four seconds, five seconds clip. So that's why we're trying to collect as much as possible sleep, physiological sleep, non uh, contaminated with the uh, with, uh, uh, epileptic uh, activity, and as well with, uh, with awake. But during the awake, we don't have see much uh, spikes and uh, epilept epileptic activity. So therefore, uh, our sleep uh, data and sleep baseline as a more close relationship to epileptic activity because we can we can we can clip that from the from the same page as we see uh, uh, spikes and in the wake we collect this uh, baseline while a patient is awake from the beginning of the recording. That's actually it's a good point. We haven't tied it yet to normalize uh, activity that we epileptic activity that we capture in the wake session because most of them are in the sleep but it's really interesting to see what the result will look like. Uh, we also want to compare, as you mentioned, EEG and MEG. We implement a flag that you can insert into our pipeline if you want to use only MEG or only EEG or both. So in other studies that we did, we kind of compared the three combination. And we also want to do it here in the control causality to see what will happen if we'll run it only using the EG data, how well we we'll capture the connectivity. So yeah, this is uh, one of the next steps. Okay. Thank you very much. It's almost like you are writing with us the paper. It's uh, <laughs> exactly the question we want to answer. <laughs> okay, thank you very much again. Um, we are a little bit ahead of time, so thanks everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Looking forward to work together. Bye. Bye-bye.